Hello folks, welcome back to Spencer's Bookshelf and welcome to the fourth installment on my YouTube channel. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me today on the fourth episode and the fourth book review that I'll be doing. Uh, today I will be reviewing Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so firstly I just want to say uh, thanks again for joining. Uh, make sure to hit subscribe which is just at the bottom. It means a lot to me. The more people that subscribe, the more people um the more youtube will put this into the different feeds for people and more people can view my videos which allows me to help with my mission of getting people to read and my mission is to do book reviews to influence you to read more um so just also a quick recap i have this is my fourth video uh, i have three other videos first one i reviewed um, John Taylor from Duran Duran's book in the Pleasure Groove, um, British Prime Minister, a uh, former British Prime Minister, David Cameron's book, uh, For the Record, uh, Courtney Carver's book, Soulful Simplicity, and the book, A Field Guide to Lies, um, in the last episode. So, uh, please, please, um, watch those previous videos if you haven't seen them. And, uh, let's begin. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Uh, firstly, what is an outlier? Uh, an outlier is someone who is exceptional in a specific field. Uh, example, Bill Gates when it comes to computer programming and computer science. Or Michael Jordan when it comes to basketball. Uh, Tiger Woods when it comes to golf. Um... Or Stephen Hawking's when it comes to um, physics. So there are people that are not just not only successful, but are in the top of their field. And this book attempts to figure out why certain people are just a bit above everyone else. Um, and that's why... Uh, and it, it, I think it's something too where we all we all have people we look up to in certain areas of life. Um, I know for myself, uh, I mean, my I'll mention him again. My favorite basketball player is Michael Jordan. A few other favorite basketball players as well. Um, but growing up playing basketball, I mean, I was decent, but I played like high school basketball. Never made it on the university team. Didn't even try out because I knew I wasn't good enough. Um, but in my head, I was always like, well, you know what, what did Michael Jordan do at my age when I was 16, 17, 18, that I wasn't doing? And that's why I like this book, because it kind of dives into that sort of notion of what is it that makes people exceptional? So the first thing that, uh, the book, uh, or actually the first thing I'll talk about in terms of the book and... And what Malcolm Gladwell attempts to do is he, he attempts to show trends. He's not looking for actualities. Um, so what he's saying is is not black and white. It's a bit more gray, but it, there's some correlation in the data that he's provided in this book. And I'm going to go through a few different topics in the book. He actually mentions quite a few different things that all relate to the outlier uh, realm. But I am going to only mention a few. And then after I'm going to talk about my personal um, opinion of the book and whether you should read it or not. Uh, so um, firstly, another thing, major thing he talks about is, um, before I go into the details, is the idea of luck. And one thing he says is, yes, outliers work really hard, but there's always an element of luck to it. Um... And we'll start off with the first uh, topic, and that's uh, something you've probably heard of before, uh, the January effect. So Malcolm Gladwell talks about how Canadian hockey players um, who, do, who make it to the NHL uh, tend to be born in January or February or sometimes March, and not in November or December or October. Uh, I mean, there are certain ones that are. Uh, but the vast majority of people, or of hockey players, are born at that time. And why is that? It's because 
In Canada, and in other places presumably as well, hockey is started at a young age. So when you're three years old, and you're born in January, and or you're four years old, or whenever you're starting to play hockey, generally it's really young in Canada, you have a huge distinct advantage because you, as a human, have grown 25% more than someone born in November or December. Because if you're four years old, or you just turned four, but half your team is three, and some of them just turned three, do you think that the the kid who just turned three has a a, a, a physical advantage over the four-year-old, especially at an age where you're growing at such a rapid pace? And that's what he talks about. And another thing too is in Canada, and in other places too, when, when you're young and you're starting to show promise right away, re then resources are provided to you. And that could be coaching, um, better equipment, more attention, things like that. And that's what allows you to succeed. And that's... Um, so what that is saying is some of what outliers... Uh, or how outliers become successful can be elements of luck and elements of being sort of in the right place at the right time. But that's not everything. And that's where I'll we'll move to the another aspect of what he talks about, which is the 10,000 hour rule. And I think 10,000 hour rule, so this book being about 10 years old-ish, um, some of these concepts are actually quite well known now. And I... I think most people know about the 10,000 hour rule uh, and what that talks about is if you want to be an expert and an absolute expert in a chosen field, you need to do 10,000 hours of practice on it. So for that, that um, he gives the example of the Beatles and Bill Gates. Um, and I'll backtrack just a little bit. The reason why he talks about this is to show that it isn't all about luck. Being in the right place at the right time is an element of it, but also being in the right place at the right time and having the right opportunity while doing the necessary things, which is practice, 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 is what makes you an outlier. So, for instance, uh, the Beatles. So the Beatles in 1961 and uh, 62, they kind of came to the USA. It might have actually been 63. Uh, don't quote me, but it's it's around that time period the Kennedy time period, uh, they came to the U.S. and uh, hit up the Ed Sullivan show and, and became international um, international superstars and really one of the first international superstar bands. Um, a lot of people probably assume that they just sort of started maybe 1959 or, or something like that, but they actually started seven years prior. And they were... Um, Elton, or sorry, not Elton, John, John Lennon and Paul McCartney and the rest of his band were practicing and playing in Germany for very little money as a house band for seven years, generally playing eight hours a day live to people. Um, and that's something that people don't realize is they were playing over and over and over again. And if it wasn't for that continuous practice, making mistakes, continually getting better and better and better, that's, uh, they would not have been as successful as they were. Um, same thing with Bill Gates. So Bill Gates, uh, Gladwell kind of talks on both fronts about the practice he did, which was exceptional but also to the element of luck that Gates had as well. So Bill Gates uh, went to an elite private school uh, in grade seven. He moved from public to private school and they had, they had a computer in there. And it, this is a long time ago. This is uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, computers were very expensive and things like that. But Bill Gates utilized that and was able to start teaching himself programming at a young age, at, in grade seven. And he had a, a small circle of friends that would do the same thing. And actually that computer club became bankrupt. And, um, there, or not that it came bankrupt, they just lost all their funding. So his group of friends then 
uh, utilized the University of Washington in Seattle where they lived and then utilized their computers there and was able to uh, continually program. Uh, and they, they just kept going and going and going to which they were programming about eight hours a day, seven days a week, and which yielded actually a lot more than 10,000 hours. But if it wasn't for Bill Gates getting that opportunity at that private school in grade seven, it never would have happened. So the thing that Gladwell does, which I think is really good, is he's kind of balances the sort of luck aspect to the hard work aspect. Um, because, uh, luck and hard work, they, it kind of goes hand in hand in creating an outlier. Um, one other aspect that I'll talk about as well, there's quite a few good ones. I mean, he, he talks about, uh, culture, culture and communication and how that can affect your ability to succeed. Um, he talks about where, um, stories of where people were born and the fact that they couldn't succeed as a result of that. Um, and I'll talk, just touch on two quick other points. Um, the first one is about IQ. Uh, so everyone thinks, oh, if you're an outlier, you're just really much smarter and you were born smarter than everyone else. That is uh, not true. That's um, a fallacy. Um, he says that if you have a baseline of 115, which is a bit more than average, average is about 100, uh, of an IQ, uh, you that's all you need. Uh, anything beyond that's not really going to help you. After that, it's about how hard you work, your element of luck, and your ability to be creative and to take risks. Uh, so I found that was an amazing nugget of information. Um, the other thing, too, that I really th thought was kind of interesting was he talked about old money in the U.S. So the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, uh, and how they were able to amass a huge amount of wealth. Um, and he basically shows the element of luck in that aspect. So the element of luck for the Carnegies and Rockefellers is they were all born in the late 1830s and early 1840s. And why was that lucky? Because in the 1860s and 1870s, when they were middle-aged, America was going through the Industrial Revolution, um, or their version of the Industrial Revolution. So the railways being built, um, manufacturing was booming, um, the U.S. were starting to take shape as, as, a, as a bigger power than what they were before. So the thing that allowed these... American oligarchs to be super, super wealthy and super successful is they were at the right place at the right time. Yes, they worked hard. They would have had um, business savvy. They would have, especially for that time, they would have um, probably had great leadership skills to be able to organize setting up a transcontinental railway uh, and things like that. But nevertheless, it was an element of they were at the right place at the right time. So these are my thoughts on the book. Firstly, I love this book. Uh, it was a great book, easy to read, really interesting. Uh, I wish I could talk more about it, but I don't want this video to be like an hour. Um, I think one thing that, uh, from my own perspective, that really uh, touches home is, well, I wouldn't even say it touches home, but it really made me think even beyond what he was reading is the fact that us as humans we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be great and to be amazing and what he attempts to do is to say no I mean yes work hard follow your dreams but if you're not number one it's not your fault it's because some people do have a lot of luck they're in the right place at the right time and they're able to do things uh, they're able to take advantage of situations that none of us have the opportunity to do. Uh, and I think that's, that's I think, a very uh, important point. And I think a lot of people who want to be successful and see themselves not doing as well as others, that creates things like depression. It creates a lot of unnecessary grief. And 
what this book I think attempts to do on an emotional point of view is to say, no, it's okay. You, you're good at what you do. You may not be the best. You may have not put in 10,000 hours, but you know what? A lot of the reason why you're maybe not Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods or Barack Obama is because you're not in the right place at the right time. And um, I think that this book does an amazing job of that. Secondly, his writing skills are, it's Malcolm Gladwell. It's the best. Like I flew through that book. I grasped everything. I wanted to read it again. Um, I mean, it's, it was a bestseller for a reason. And he's an amazing author. Uh, he has so many amazing books. So uh, it was, the writing style was just superb. Um, further to that, I think it was, uh, it's a good book, especially at a time, or to read at a time like now during covid where we have a lot of time, a lot of people are pretty self-reflective right now. And I think a lot of people want to be as successful as possible, or they want to look at what they're doing and think to themselves, how can I be better? But at the same time, what this book does is says, hold up. You don't need to put so much pressure on yourself. These are the reasons why these people are very successful. You don't need to push yourself uh, to be as successful as them in terms of having expectations. Um, so I think this book's a great book. Uh, I'm giving it a four and a half out of five. Uh, I think it's, it's, it shows, uh, all the elements that I think is great. It's, it's great book to read right now. Uh, it's well written. Um, the, uh, the stories in it that he provides or the, uh, the commentary that he provides is, is amazing. Um, I wish I could talk more about it. I, I, I I liked some of the other stuff that he talked about, uh, but I think it was a great book. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, I'm excited to keep going with this channel. Um, I'm definitely going to be uh, putting out some more videos in the next uh, week or so. Um, if you have any book requests, please send them my way. Follow me on Twitter uh, at Spencer's Bookshelf. Um, I'll be um, posting videos on my Twitter feed as well uh, at all times. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Bye, guys.